Good evening all. Terrorism poses a significant threat to the people in every country. And in India we have witnessed many terrorist attacks from the alien enemy and within the country people. And in India we have a set of national security laws. Let's have a look into the enactment and enforcement of those laws. Hello. Today, I, Tripti Vishnui, a first-year law student at DS Law College, am going to speak on the topic Preventive Detention Act 1950. Firstly, let's discuss what is exactly preventive detention. It means to detain a person so that to prevent that person from committing on any possible crime or in other words, preventive detention is an action taken by the administration on the grounds of the suspicion that some Strong action may be done by the person concerned which will be prejudicial to the state. Preventive retention is the most contentious part of a scheme fundamental right in the Indian Constitution Article 22.3 provides that if the person who has been arrested or detained under preventive detention laws then the protection against arrest and detention provided under Article 22.1 and 22.2 shall not be available to that person. India became free in 1947 and the constitution was adopted in 1950. It is extraordinary that the framers of the Indian constitution who suffered the most because of the preventive detention laws did not hesitate to give its sanctity to the preventive detention laws and that too in the fundamental rights chapter of the constitution. Some parts of Article 22 are not fundamental rights but are the fundamental dangers to the citizens of India for whom the constitution was framed to usher in a new society with freedom of expression and freedom of association available to all. In 1950 itself, a preventive detention act was piloted by Sardar Patel who said that he had several sleepless nights before he could decide that it was a necessary thing to introduce such a bill. The first Preventive Detention Act was enacted by the Parliament on 26 February 1950 and in 1950 under this act, ordinary disturbers of ordinary order and peace were not arrested, but a political leader of A.K. Gopalan's eminence was arrested. Even from that initial action, it was evident that these acts were meant to curb political dissent and that legacy has been and is being followed. Its purpose to prevent anti-national elements from carrying out acts that are hostile to nation security and defense. The said act was supposed to end after the remaining two years in practice, but the time limit of the act was increased from time to time and finally it was abolished in the year 1971. Now, let's discuss the grounds for preventive detention. It can only be detained for only for four grounds. Firstly, security of state. Secondly, maintenance of public order. Third, maintenance of supplies and essential services and defense. Th fourth, foreign affairs or security of India. A person may be detained without trial only on any or some of the above grounds. A detainee under preventive detention can have no right of personal liberty guaranteed under Article 19 and Article 21. Now, Preventive Detention Act 1950 reinforces human detention in situation where state conditions are involved, such as uh, national defense, the preservation of peace and public order, international affairs, etc. According to Preventive Detention Act 1950, it can be extended beyond 3 months up to a total of 12 months only on the favourable recommendation of an advisory board made up of High Court judges or person eligible to be appointed as High Court judges. The Act was questioned on its validity in the case of A.K. Gopalan versus the State of Madras at the Supreme Court and with the exception of some provisions, the Supreme Court held that the Act was constitutionally valid. The act before getting expired in the year 1969 was amended seven times and the reason for each amendment was to extend its validity for three more years and so was extended until 31 December 1969. In short, 
preventive detention as enshrined under Article 22 strikes a devastating blow to the personal liberties. It also runs afoul of international standard. Article 4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, in short ICCPR, which India has ratified, admittedly permits derogation from guaranteeing certain personal liberties during a state of emergency. The government, however, has not invoked this privilege, nor could it, as the current situation in India does not satisfy with standards set effort in Article 4. Now, after the Preventive Detention Act 1950, let's discuss Armed Forces Special Powers Act 1958. Armed Forces Special Powers Act 1958 is an act of the Parliament of India that grants special power to the Indian Armed Forces. It gives them the power to maintain public order in disturbed areas. According to the Disturbed Areas Special Courts Act 1976, once declared disturbed, that area, that area has to maintain status quo for a minimum of three months. Now let's discuss what is a disturbed area and who has the power to declare it. A disturbed area is one which is declared by notification under section 3 of the act. An area can be disturbed due to differences or disputes between members of different religi religion, race, language or regional groups or caste or community. The central government or the governor of the state or the administrator of the union territory can declare the whole or part of the state or union territory as a disturbed area. A suitable notification would have to be made in the official gazette. As per section 3 of the act, it can be invoked in the places where the use of armed forces in aid of the civil power is necessary. Now if we discuss the powers. They have the authority to prohibit a gathering of five or more person in an area. They can use force or even open fire after giving due warning if they feel a person is in contravention of the law. If reasonable suspicion exists, the army can also arrest a person without a warrant, enter or search a premise without a warrant and ban the possession of firearms. Any person arrested or taken into custody may be handed over to the officer in charge of the nearest police station along with a report, report detailing the circumstances that led to the arrest. Now coming to the question of the origin of the act. The act came into the force in the context of increasing violence in the northeastern states decades ago which the state government found difficult to control. The Armed Forces Special Powers Bill was passed by both the houses of the parliament and it was approved by the president on September 11, 1958. Since that time, it became to known as the Armed Forces Special Powers Act 1958. Now coming to the question of which state come under this act. This act is effective in whole of Nagaland, Assam, Manipur excluding seven assembly constituencies of Imphal and parts of Arunachal Pradesh. It is also be to, to be noticed that the centre revoked it in Meghalaya on 1st April 2018. Earlier, the act was effective in a 20 km area along the Assam-Meghalaya border. In Arunachal Pradesh, the impact of the act was reduced to around 8 police station instead of earlier 16 police station and in Tirap, Longding, Changlang district bordering Assam. It, also to, it, uh, it should also be noted that Tripura withdrew, withdrew the act in 2015. Jammu and Kashmir too has a similar act. At the end, I just would like to add that this act is arbitrary. If left unchecked and unfettered, this act can pose clear and present danger to India's constitutional mandates of freedom, liberty and rule of law. It should either be 
upheld by the parliament as recommended by justice jeevan reddy committee or pronounced unconstitutional by the supreme court of india thank you hello everyone i am naman sonu from pimr indore hope this video find you well i am present here to discuss about some national security laws of india uh, national security act 1980 the nsa popularly known as law of no appeal no appeal and no delivery was promulgated on 23 september 1980 with the purpose to provide uh, for preventive detention in certain cases and for matters connected there with they extend to the whole of india it contains 18 sections this act empowers the central government and state government to detain a person to prevent him or her from acting in any matter prejudicial to the security of india the relation of india with foreign countries and the maintenance of public sector to the maintenance of supplies and services essential to the community it is necessary to do so historical background of the act india is one of the few countries in the world whose constitution allows for preventive detention during peace time Article 23 clause 3 says that the rights available to an arrested person will not be applicable in case of preventive detention. The National Security Act has its roots in the preventive detention laws. The first iteration of these laws was framed during the British rule. However, post independence these laws were carried forward as the Preventive Detention Act of 1950. This was replaced by Maintenance of Internal Security Act MISA of 1971 and finally the national security act of 1980 there are several important provisions of the act which include uh, the nsa empowers the central or state government to detain a person to prevent him from acting in any manner prejudicial to national security the maximum period for which one may be detained is 12 months but the term can be extended if the government finds fresh evidence the detained person also does not have the right to legal aid or to move a bail application before a criminal court the detained person can also be held for 10 days without uh, being told the charges against him states or uh, center can detain a person from acting in any manner prejudicial to india's security the act is involved in maintenance of public law and order National Security Act gives power to state or central government to detain any person in the interest of national security and public order. There are some constitutional provisions related to National Security Act 1980. Article 22, clause 3, sub clause B allows for preventive detention and restrictions on personal liberty for reasons of state security and public order. Article 22, Clause 4 states that no law providing for preventive detention shall authorize the detention of a person for a longer period that, than three months, unless an advisory board reports sufficient cause or for ex- extended detention. The 44th Amendment Act of 1978 has reduced the period of detention without obtaining the opinion of an advisory board from three to two months. However, this period, uh, this provision has not yet been brought into force. Hence, the original period of three months still continues. Criticism of the Act: The NSA has been under scrutiny of the critics since its enforcement. As per the provisions of CRPC, any person who has been arrested without a warrant will not be detained in custody for more than 24 hours. A detained person has the right to be produced before magistrate within 24 hours. of such arrest this is also a fundamental right under article 22 clause 2 cases under the nsa are not recorded under the national crime records bureau as no fir is registered in such cases the data black hole uh, that exists with respect to preventive detention cases have been one of the prime concern a person detained under nsa cannot seek legal advice from a legal practitioner This is the contrary to the legal provision under Article 22, Clause 
which states that a detainee has the right to legal aid. Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 1967 The UAPA was introduced in 1967 as a legislation to set out reasonable restriction on the fundamental freedoms under Article 19 Clause 1 of the Constitution, such as freedom of speech, right to assemble peacefully, and right to form association. These restrictions were meant to be used to safeguard India's integrity and sovereignty. Over the years, Tata and Kota were repealed after running into legal trouble and the UAPA became the primary anti-terror legislation in India. Since 2004, there have been a number of amendments to the UAPA to make it strict when it comes to the right of accused and include more terror-related offences. In line and with its stated objectives, the UAPA punishes the commission, funding and support of unlawful activities and terror acts. So, what is unlawful activity? It refers to any action taken by individual or association, whether by committing an act or by words either spoken or written or by signs to question, disclaim, disrupt or is intended to disrupt the territorial integrity and sovereignty of India. Extension of the Act and Application of the Act It is applicable across the entire country. Any Indian or foreign national charged under UAPA is liable for punishment under this Act, irrespective of location or crime, location of crime or offence committed. UAPA will be applicable to the offenders in the same manner even if the crime is committed on foreign land or outside India. The provisions of the Act apply also to citizens of India and abroad. Persons on ships and aircraft registered in India where, wherever they may be are also under the ambit of this Act. Recently, in 2019, the UAPA was amended. The increasing threat of terrorism on the security of Indian territory compelled the government to amend the UAPA. The new amendment provides enormous power to the government to declare anyone terrorist under the terrorist act. The law is based on the anti-terror law which most countries like China, Israel and the US follow. The investigating officer of the NIA has been given the power to investigate and conduct raids in case of suspicion over the property being used for any kind of terrorist activity. The individual has been provided with an opportunity to represent himself or herself before the Home Ministry and after that, in case of injustice, he can move an appeal before the committee headed by retired or sitting judges and Cabinet Secretary of Government of India. Talking about criticism, the newly amended Act has faced a lot of criticism due to arbitrary power exercised by the government to declare a person terrorist or striking over the fundamental rights of speech, expression, life and liberty under the constitution of India. Since the act was brought to put a curb on the unlawful activities and eliminate the terrorism in order to establish peace and harmony, but the government started misusing it to come raising dissent voice against itself. There are some draconian procedural provisions which allow the state to keep people in custody for extended periods of time without bail. The bail provision is particularly, particularly problematic since it basically allows for nearly indefinite imprisonment even without conviction of the accused. Without even any concrete proof, the prosecution, police or state version just need to indicate a terror related offence on the face of it. While High Court like the Delhi High Court had tried to ensure that the police have some reasonable evidence to back up their claim of a prima facie terror related case. The Supreme Court in the Vatali judgment of 2019 delivered a judgment which allows the authorities to say that the courts cannot strictly scrutinize the material provided to claim that there is a prima facie case. This has made even more difficult for people accused under the UAPA to get bail, even if the case against them is extremely lenient. Thank you. Good evening all. 
India security laws is not restricted into one or two laws, but there was a persistent logic that was used against the minority communities and the critics of the government. After serious terrorist attacks, the countries, uh, con- the countries across the globe started to impose more serious detention laws on the people. And after the 9-11 attack in the United States, the countries started to rethink on their current anti-terrorism laws and it was in India, it was the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2002. Over 76,000 people were arrested under the predecessor law TADA and the pathetic conviction rate was just 1%. Thus, TADA was suspended and the government continued to search for new ways uh, to increase the state's power in anti-terrorism laws. The central government, the law commission, uh, the central government's law commission proposed a bill called a Criminal Law Amendment Bill. And later in 2000, uh, the bill was uh, replaced by an ordinance called Prevention of Terrorism Ordinance, POTO. And uh, the government was well equipped with much examples to argue that such an aggressive law was needed at that time. But the advocates of the uh, this ordinance, uh, that was the then Prime Minister Adil Bihari Vajpayee and the Home Minister L.K. Advani faced much criticism and disagreement about this ordinance from the opposition leaders. They argued that the bill will crack down on Muslims uh, while leaving the Hindu extremists to engage in uh, more violent acts free from the ordinance liability. And, they, and the ruling party were unable to gather much uh, the requisite political support. But in 2001, the parliament attack again made this as a topic of discussion. And uh, in Rajya Sabha, they attained a majority, but in Lok Sabha, uh, majority votes wasn't there. And L.K. Advani argued that the defendants could invoke the right to silence and anything said in the uh, course of the interrogation could be used in the court against them. And the POTO explicitly uh, barred the police from uh, using uh, coercion in order to obtain a statement from an individual and the uh, state could punish any police official uh, found abusing this authority with a fine and uh, an imprisonment of up to two years. The president called for a joint session of the two houses and gained a majority and it was uh, the uh, it was the uh, third time uh, when a joint session from a joint session a majority was uh, obtained for a bill. On 28 March 2002, POTO, that is the Prevention of Terrorism Ordinance, became Prevention of Terrorism Act 2002. The Prevention of Terrorism Act 2002 is divided into six chapters. In Section 3, it says that a terrorist act is an act done with an intent to threaten the sovereignty, integrity, unity, security of India or to strike terror in the people of India or any particular section of the people and there are special courts established under this act to deal with their cases under POTA and the central government has the final say in determining over which cases the special courts shall have the jurisdiction. Mere association or communication with the suspected terrorist can become criminal liability and the pre-trial police detention can be up to 180 days and also says that uh, a denial of bail to the accused for up to one year as long as the prosecution's opposition to the bail request satisfies the court. Some of the POTO's provision uh, seriously infringes the individual civil liberties of Indians and especially the minority communities and the statutes infringes upon the uh, individual's constitutional rights to freedom of association and freedom of expression. And POTO also uh, obstructs detainees from uh, proper legal representation, the right to have a fair bail hearing, and right to confront accusers, and the right to be uh, to have an open, publicly scrutinized trial. And it also has an impact on the minority community as it violates the uh, equal protection of law guaranteed under Article 14 of the Indian Constitution. It also uh, violates the uh, due process of law uh, guaranteed under Article 19 and Article 21 as, as those articles protect every citizen of India uh, from uh, infringement of their fundamental rights. Of the incidents related to the POTA is illustrated in the slide. 
the first one that is the 2001 indian parliament attack which resulted in the death of nine people and injured many civilians uh, four muslim extremists were arrested uh, for of plotting the 2001 parliament attack shakat husain guru uh, mohammed absal were uh, arrested shortly after the attack in the uh, accusation of belonging to the banned terrorist group jaish e mohammed and a uh, lecturer of delhi university that is said abdul rahman jilani and uh, shakat husain guru's wife afsan guru uh, were arrested under the conspiracy and a uh, special court in delhi uh, which deals with the pota cases uh, found the three men guilty and sentenced them to death and afsan guru uh, was guilty of concealing the knowledge of the attack uh, of the parliament uh, she she has been sentenced to uh five years and with a fine of rupees 10000 but they uh, the four of them appealed uh, to the uh, delhi high court and delhi high court decided that uh, there is uh, they found that there is no involvement of uh, mr jilani and afsan guru and this shows the uh, difference in the uh, proceedings and the decision of the of a special court and the normal delhi high court and the second incident that is the 911 attack uh, takes place in the uh united states uh 19 al qaeda uh, militants had hijacked four planes and they carried out a suicidal attack against certain uh, selected targets in the united states the first is the world trade center and second is the pentagon and the third they targeted white house of ca- uh, capital building but uh, the the uh, they crashed in the field uh, near pennsylvania it remains the most deadliest attack in the human history around 2000 people were killed and uh, the release of tons of toxic debris from the buildings caused major serious uh, health issues for the people residing there and uh, during a uh, um, military raid uh, in pakistan the mastermind of this attack usama bin laden was killed and the next gujarat riots uh, during the gujarat riot many muslims were arrested uh with the charges of uapa act and according to the human rights watch not one hindu has in not one hindu has been uh, charged under uapa and the uh, it clearly showed the gujarat and central government's direct violation of the constitution's equal protection clause and and the uh, misuse of pota uh, resulted in the, the many uh, violent acts from the side of hindu extremist too and uh, it was in uh, different from tada that the uh, predecessor law uh, and it also enhanced uh, police powers limits on the rights of defense uh, confession made in uh, public custody admissible to as evidence and uh, setting up of special courts too and then the uh, the nda government brought an ordinance which implemented uh, which uh, implemented the recommendations of the pota review committee and it it also states that uh, the pota is more worse than tada finally on september 17 uh, 2004 the union cabinet approved ordinance to repeal the contravention prevention of terrorism act 2002 and amended the unlawful activities prevention act 1967 there some more uh, national security laws in india uh, currently uapa uh is one of the acts uh, deals with the anti national activities in india uh, now intense criticism of uapa uh, is going on after the uh, death of father stan swami in the jail and he was denied of bail and the next act that is the misab the maintenance of internal security act uh, it has been uh, widely uh, misused uh, by the then prime minister indira gandhi during the emergency period and then the nia that is the uh, national investigation agency bill that was passed in uh, 2008 just after the mumbai terrorist attack india has witnessed the assassination of its prominent civil rights leader and father of nation mahatma gandhi ji the prime minister indira gandhi and the former prime minister rajiv gandhi and the retired army chief and the mastermind behind operation blue star that is general arun kumar shrita vaidya and a millions of indian citizen during terrorist or anti national activities the empowerment of national security laws uh, has seen effective uh, control of uh, anti national activities in india but in a democracy like india 
people's right to has its place only an accountable body of people that is the an accountable government can decide which act is to be enacted so that both the situations can be tackled thank you